thankful that you come today. Amen. God bless you. And if you have your Bibles, if you would like to turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 11. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see Barbara back with us today. Yes. Denise is here today. Everybody's here today. Thank Amen. God you're here. If you weren't here, you wouldn't be here. So you're here. Amen. Genesis chapter 11 and verse number 1. 11 chapter Genesis verse number 1. The Bible says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Go to and let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to and let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. The book of Matthew, chapter 18. The book of Matthew, chapter 18. Verse number 19. The scripture says again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Jesus, we love you today. We are so thankful for the people who've come, the faithful that are here. We're thankful for your presence. We're thankful, God, for the Holy Ghost that touches our hearts. Allow us today to tune in tune up and to be able to receive what it is that you have for us today. We're quick to give you all the praise and all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. This afternoon, I want to preach to you a message titled Unity. Unity. One of the greatest advantages and position of power that God had ever given to we as his people is and always has been none other than that of unity. See, unity is that visible force that carries within it an invincible power. What I'm saying to you today is when it is the people and especially God's people who operate and who together rally themselves together under the banner of unity, with the Spirit of God being both their rear guard and their very present power and strength, in and through God it is we as a people whose boundaries are limitless and whose might in and through the name of Jesus Christ is what has no end. Banded together, bound together, in the spiritual realm, arms locked together, moving as a force in a forward motion, moving as a people as they did back in Genesis chapter 11 as one, one mind, one heart, one accord, one purpose, one direction, serving one God. As I said today, we read in Genesis 11 where the Bible says the whole earth was of one language and one speech who together set forth to build a city and a tower that would reach up to heaven. Now this, their express purpose was of not allowing themselves to ever be scattered abroad. In their thinking, it was a people who together devised a plan that was meant to outsmart God. You can get it for, you can be unified for good and you can be unified for bad. And in the book of Genesis chapter one, verse five and six, the Bible says, when the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the men of uh, God had built, the Lord said, behold, this people is one. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Get that in your mind for just a moment. Leave that up for a second, Brother Holland. 
whatever they would imagine, they were one. Whatever they imagined, they would have the ability and the power to do. To do what? To do whatever it was together that they wanted to do. That was the invincible power that was present. That was the visible force that God saw of the spirit of unity. See, God understood quite clearly that the plan as they, the people had devised, it was God knew that their limitless and their invincible force and the potential of the spirit of unity would have carried within it. God knew that. He saw that. He looked down and thought, wait a minute, what they're doing isn't a good thing. And it was this invincible force called unity yes. when used in the right context is a weapon that carries within it the ability to be what takes we as humanity, church, into a dimension that this world and all of its vices could never imagine, nor could they ever hope to experience such a force as this. Unity. The world doesn't know unity. The world knows division. The world knows to break it up. God is a God of reconciliation. He brings things back together. The Bible talks about how he brings together a family and a people as one. And if the world knew of this power and if they grabbed a hold of this power, I'll tell you then the world would be completely different. But when the church takes a hold of this power and this invincible ability to be able to take on anything that stands before them in unity, then it's the world who had better look out. So we've been looking at the many conquests that the people of God had both faced and won when in battle against the enemy in the Old Testament, when it was the enemy who was in direct opposition to God. That's one person we never want to mess with. Don't get God mad. What it is that you'll find is in each case and amidst the circumstances at hand is the fact that when it was the people of God, catch this now, who in the name of the Lord banded together in a spirit of unity, of one mind and one accord in unity, and they faced off the enemy. When they faced them, they didn't face them as two or three. They didn't face them five or six. They faced them off as one. And I believe today that the deciding factor that brought victory to the people of God was not the fact that they're only coming in the name of the Lord, their God, but they also, the real deciding factor, rested in the fact that they were together and they were unified. A people who often were many came together as one. Right. You just think about what I said for a moment when you read of the conquest of the man called Gideon, who with his 300 men went up against thousands, the Bible says, with nothing other than their pitchers, their trumpets, and their shout. Turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. We're going to begin this afternoon at verse number 16. And this is speaking of Gideon, it says, He divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me, and do likewise, and behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall you do. When I blow the, with the trumpet, and I with all of the camp, then they that, pardon me, blow with me, they blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets, and they break the pitchers that were in their hands, and the three companies blew the trumpets, and they break the pitchers, and held the lamps in their hand, and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all, and they cried, the sword of, Lord, of the Lord, pardon me, and of Gideon. Going down to verse number 21, next verse, it says, and they stood every man in his place. 
They didn't go running around. They didn't go jump up, shutting down, uh, go down into the valley. But they stood every man in his place round about the camp with all the hosts, ran and cried and fled. And the 300 blew the trumpets. And the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. And the hosts fled to Bethsaida and to Zareth and to the border of Abel Meloth and to Daptabeth, pardon me, Gideon. Ladies and gentlemen, a man of valor. He was an, an able general. He was a fighter. He was smart. He was God-directed and he was God-led. Gideon was a man whose army's military might was noted throughout all the land. Everybody knew about Gideon. You're going to get in a fight with Gideon? You best be getting ready to get into a fight because you're probably going to lose. And it was this same Gideon whom God proved. I want you to hear this now. He proved to him and to his 300 men that their greatest weapon against the enemy lay not in their swords or strength, but in the power of the Lord and the true spirit of unity. As Gideon and his 300 men took their positions, I want you to hear this, church. It's so important if we would just catch it today and we would move forward from this day in this mode. I'm going to tell you, it's limitless where God is going to take us. But he it put them into positions. But if any one of the men had failed to be unified one with another and did not do what together they were told to do in unity, I believe that their victory would have been short-lived. And instead, it would have... In winning a victory for God, they would have instead been sadly defeated. If one of them was off step, or maybe a dozen, they didn't really didn't believe what Gideon was about to do. They thought they're all going to die, but it, but they weren't that way. You see, it was because they were together, they were unified, yes. and they operated as one under the banner of unity. And the Lord, because of this, was able to do through them what no other human being by themselves could have ever done. Amen. If any two, just two of us. And you know, sometimes you say, well, you know, pastor, I've done that. We prayed together and we believed together. And, and who knows what it's looking like in the spirit world? Who knows where maybe your mind was? It was maybe it wasn't really focused, you know? I'll join together with you in prayer and I'll believe God. But in the back of your mind and in deep in your heart, you don't really believe. And so you pray, and it doesn't happen. I've also seen where two had agreed and they two did believe. And yeah. when they did call on the name of yeah. Jesus Christ, what it was that they asked for happened. Amen. Amen. It happened. Yes. Things happened. Whatever it was that they were praying for happened. Amen. You'll find that the same contributing factors were there with when Joshua and his men and the priests that were with him together. They marched around the walls of Jericho as the Lord had instructed Joshua in the book of Joshua, chapter 6. Let's turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 6. And we're going to look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. The Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And you shall compass the city, all you men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days, and the seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horn. And on the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make the long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Verse number 15, it says, came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day, and they compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day, on this day, Today, right here, right now, on that day, they can pass the city seven times. And verse 20 says, so the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people had heard the sound of the trumpets and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city 
every man straight before him, and they took the city. Now, I'm going to talk to you in the human mind, in a, in a comprehension of our human understanding. This wall, I don't think, was six feet high and about a foot and a half wide. It was a great wall. It was a big wall, and it compassed the city. And the Bible says nobody came in and nobody went out. They were shut up. But I'll tell you something, when the church, when the people of God would get together, when Joshua and his men and those priests did exactly as God had told them, he told them to do this together. He told them to do it really in, in a kind of a roundabout way in the spirit of unity. And when the people began to shout, the walls of that city fell down flat. I'll tell you, there was a lot of shocked people that day. There's a lot of people that were looking at all this rubble and watching the people shout and go and take that city. And who was it that went before? It was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It was God Almighty that went into that city with him. It's God who was able to give them that city to take it with a shout. See, God time and time again throughout the Old Testament writings illustrates for we as his people this invincible force mm -hmm. and this power that the spirit of unity when resident in and among us has the ability to do. Amen. And it's this visible force of unity when demonstrated before the people who are before us in this city, in this town. Oh, well, you nobody come. You're just a little assembly. You're just a small group of people. But let me tell you, when unity strikes this church, when the people as a body come together as one in the power of Jesus' name, all we can tell the devil is get out of our way. We don't have to worry about him. He's got to worry about him. It's he who's got the problem and we who carry that power. Because it unleashes in us the ability in the name of Jesus Christ to be the ones who are able to do and to accomplish anything in God that God desires for us as his people to do. Look at this beautiful church. I did it myself. No, I didn't. We did it together. We, we worked for it. We put it together. And now we're going to enjoy this church. We picked up that name called the Sanctuary, a place of refuge. And this is where the church comes. This is where the family of God comes together. We gather together in the power of one. And I'll tell you what, everybody who walks through our doors, a visitor or a child of God, they know that they're welcome here, that they're wanted here, that we belong together, that we are a people of God. In the New Testament, it was Jesus who had not only given, but Jesus had also imparted to we as the church this force and power within the spirit of unity. So that when it is we like the disciples who had done mighty works after the birth of the church, you see, it's we too, if we would only seek in our lives to tap into this resident power. Can I tell you today that the spirit of unity is here? We began to sing those songs, and I know you heard the story before, but the doodads started going up and down, and I thought, God, you are here. The presence of the Holy Ghost is here. That spirit of God, I'll tell you, we were singing in one. We were unified together as a body. We were singing and worshiping the great King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Tapping into that resident power, that spirit of unity, we the church of the 21st century would be able to take this world by storm. We could move into the city. We're going to move into a new dimension. We're going to find people coming. We had 21 visitors and I think about four, four to six weeks worth of time that walked through our doors. And I think that's just a baby. That's just what God started to do. What we've got to do is catch that vision. What we've got to do is to stay together. What we have to do is band together and we'll talk about all the good things and not the bad. Instead of talking about one another, let's talk about what the Lord is about to do, what God wants to do in and through us. So it is in a spirit of unity that Jesus throughout the Gospels presents to us a type of atmosphere in which his power and his spirit dwells. Where? In unity. See, what I'm saying again today is this. I wish to impart to all of you that if we as a church, new to God or not, in every service as well as any time that we gather together as one, if it would be us who would come with a purpose and intent in our coming, 
To be what? In a single mind, with a single purpose. To what? To experience the mighty move of God. Then I stand here as your pastor today to declare to you that it's God whose purpose for us and God as his people would literally unleash, unleash for me the miraculous power in us. God would allow us as a church to begin to experience what? Signs and wonders. We begin to see healings and the manifestation of the Spirit. We've already got tongues and interpretation. We've already got a move of God. And all we've got to do is band together and believe together in one mind and one accord in Jesus' name. When we get together, what are we coming for? We're coming together as one. What are we here for? We're in that spirit of unity. We're walking together. We're talking together. We're fellowshipping together. I love that fellowship hall. And, and even though I don't like preaching with food on my tummy, I want to tell you, the spirit that we feel in there and the camaraderie and the brothers and sisters and God as a family of God, the people or visitors feel it and they're going to want to start coming back and back and back. I like what I feel. I like what I see. That's a church that's unified. When you think about it, when you hear about great revivals, when hearing about the miraculous healings and the power of deliverance that is dealt to those who had come together under the banner of unity, I declare to you that it was not in the numbers nor in the fact of the multitudes that were there who had gathered together, but it was the visible force and the invincible power of unity which through the demonstration of the power of God was unleashed. I've seen these great revivals and I've heard about them and people all gathered together. You know what it is? They, you might say, well, they were just in hype. They were being hyped up. No, I'll tell you what. It's just like walking around the walls of Jericho. People began to get together. They believed in the vision. They believed in their purpose. They knew that they had come here to worship. And so somebody said, well, get out of your seat and come on up front and I'm going to lay hands on you and you're going to be healed. Who says that can't happen at the sanctuary? Who says that people can't be delivered and set free? I'll tell you, nobody, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. Book of Matthew 18 and 20, we read it today. Jesus declares where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst. Yep. Where there are two or three together in unity. Again, here I come, church, you're going to hear it again and again. One mind, one accord, two or three whose purpose and focus is one. It is then, Jesus says, that my presence and my power and my blessings will begin to freely flow for its unity and the spirit of unity that's get a guaranteed ingredient to get and to experience a powerful move of God. Unity, let me tell you, when we gather together and we are in unity, the spirit of God, as I'm feeling right now, is what flows and will move amongst our congregation. It'll begin to touch you. You get healed right where you're sitting. You'll feel the power of God. You'll walk out of church stronger and higher. you get your shoulders square back you put your head up and say, I go to the sanctuary. I come from that place of refuge. I go where spirit and truth agree, where the King of Kings, Jesus Christ Almighty, is resident in every service. See, within the confines of Matthew 18 and 20, there is revealed for us two distinct requirements necessary for a spirit of unity to be what causes Jesus' presence as well as his power to begin to manifest. First, there must be a spirit of unity among the people. Secondly, there must be a unity in being one with God. As a people together in his name, unified. You come to church with a purpose. I can't wait to see what's happening at church today. You know, this morning, when we got into service, did anybody think you were going to hear about well, just what love would do? No, but when you got here, I heard people after the service, that was a good message. You spoke to me. Maybe you never heard about the power of love. Maybe you never done heard about what the Spirit of Unity Church can do. Amen. I want you to know that any time we as a people are together in unity, there's a potential of a mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God in any place where we are. 
We could be out in the street. We could be out in the park. We could be, we can walk and hand out tracts. We could be, you know what, two of us, we go out door knocking. We can knock on the door. Oh, man, I didn't want to be here today. Yeah, me neither. That pastor is just such a taskmaster. He just do everything, you know. Or, you know what, we're going to knock on the door, and we're going to touch a life. We're going to maybe meet a family. Maybe a Sunday school kid will start to come. Look how our Sunday school started to resurrect just from a church program, just because people came. Guess what? I'll tell you why they're coming back. They like what they feel. Amen, amen. It's the Bible that bears witness to this truth and the cause and effect of unity. Acts chapter 2, if you would like to turn there in your Bibles, very familiar to this church. And if it's not, get a Bible and start reading about it. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with... <coughs> all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. I want to tell you today, I think it was a camp meeting or one of the conventions that we were in in the British Columbia district when the worship took off. I'll tell you, I personally experienced a feeling of a rushing mighty wind. They were unified, unified pardon me, the voices were all together, and it was just like, and it moved through that place. Now you've got 120 voices. You've got 120 people going to get the Holy Ghost. Yeah. They said, going to tarry until you receive this power that is new from on high. You're going to stay there in that place. And the Bible says, as they were together, some people said maybe it was a week, six to ten days. You know, some of us don't want to wait six to ten minutes. But anyhow, if we just keep focused and together, suddenly there would come the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Verse number three says, and what happened? There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Every one in that house. And if you keep reading, you'll find where when they spilled over into the streets, the multitudes came together. It was the day of Pentecost. Pentecost. Penta is, is 50 and cost is feast. It was the feast of Pentecost. People from the regions round about were gathered together. And when those 120 hit the street, honey, things started to happen. You got to come around this corner. Them disciples of Jesus are going crazy. They're worshiping, talking in tongues. We hear them speaking in our own language and glorifying God. What in the world is going on? You ought to be across from Fresh Co. When I walked down that road and I felt the power of God draw me into that little church. And when I got in there, they might be little. We might not be many, but bless God, we are mighty. I believe that the atmosphere where the 120 were was charged with a spirit Come of on. anticipation. Yeah. Wonder what it's going to preach about. Wonder what God's going to do. Right. Wonder if someone's going to get healed. Maybe someone's going to get the Holy Ghost. I don't know, but I'm just looking forward. The people were full. You know, I, I know we eat, and that's not what I'm talking about. But if we get full of expectancy as to yeah, what it yeah, was that on. God had promised, each of them had come to the upper room in that same mind and purpose, expecting to receive. Right. Are you with me today, church? They came into that upper room expecting to receive. Nobody came there and said, well, I hope he does it. I'm not sure if he will. He's already been resurrected. No, when we come to church, we don't have any idea what God wants to do. God can fill you with the Holy Ghost. God can heal your body. God can touch your mind. Why? Because the people in this church, in this sanctuary, have come and have gathered together. And we expect God to do what he says he's going to do. And we're going to begin to believe him for that very thing. Now, on the opposite side of the coin, and I've seen this 40, 40 years. I didn't think I was that old. 40 years we've been in the church. Over the years, I've seen in services where people had come, they tried to sit on the service by refusing in their hearts to let the flow of that service or even the move of God through songs and even the preaching touched them. They sat there and the side of their spirit was... Mm. 
And stubbornly they sat there in their seat. They maybe even tried to quench the spirit. And even though it was they who were not willing to allow God to move through them, in spite of them, in spite of them, God moved anyhow. You know why? Because the rest of the people that had come walked through their doors. Well, what are they going to do today? Who cares what they're I know what I've come to do. I've come to praise the Lord. I've come to worship the King of Kings. I've come to love Jesus. I've come for a healing. I came to be refreshed and renewed. I just came to get something from God and walk out of here stronger than it was when I got here. God would move through those who willingly came together and who was ready to move as one. Let me say this, whenever it is we who gather together for a service, hear this now, or a prayer meeting, any time that we as a people of God gather together with an express purpose of wanting God to move in our midst, it's essential that we all come as willing uh, participants, pardon me, ready and willing to respond. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be a spectator. I want to be a participator. I don't want to walk out of here on an empty tank. I want to be full of the Holy Ghost. Hey, look at your face. You've got a glow in your face. Look at you. You've got a smile like a Cheshire cat. What has happened to you? I just got away from Joel's place. Who's Joel? Joel 228. With stammering lips and another tongue, did he speak to this people? This is the rest and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Another thing, when the preacher, the pastor, evangelist, feels or knows that people are with him, what this does is it sets the course for a true spirit of unity. Freedom in the Holy Ghost, it puts this church, our church, on a collision course with a move of God. It's conducive to a person's receiving the Holy Ghost being set free and being released from their bondage. When you're together, you, you know what? You need to get up here and pray. You need to receive the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Pardon me, if they don't want to come, we go around them and we pray for them, lay hands on them like the Bible says, and the Holy Ghost will get poured out in their life. See, this is where the power of God is able to bring his people a renewing, a refreshing, and literally whatever it is that God and his power and ability desires to do through us. Amen. See, in our church, I look forward to the day when someone disrupts the service by running the, running the aisles or running to the altar by them. Also, throwing up their hands in the air, maybe receiving or renewing, receiving the Holy Ghost, start speaking in tongues in their seats, and doing that old change thing, sisters. Disruption caused by somebody who stands up in their seat, starts jumping and dancing and praising God. This I want you to know is what is called an uninhibited church. A church that flows under the moving of the Spirit of God and under the direction and the unction of Almighty God. This is where I don't care what you think. I didn't. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to worship God. I, it doesn't mean you, you sit down. I'm going to stand up. You don't want to worship? Well, then the rocks will take your place. Honey. Come on, yes. come on, Lord. Yes. <laughs> I've heard it told that the quickest way to obtain a mighty move of revival as well as revival and a moving of God is not for us to ask for a revival, but to pray for a spirit of unity. Mm, mm, mm. You begin to pray for us. You know, when we get church, I want when we get church and we go to our prayer meeting. I want everybody to be together. Let's get them cylinders firing. And guess what happens? It'll be from that time. Once the catalyst of unity is flowing, revival, the spirit of revival in and among the people in the church is what will begin to happen. And we're there. Oh, it's a Friday night gathering of prayer. Guess what, honey? We're, we're together. I'm worshiping God. I'm going to get what I came for. I'm going to walk out of here changed. I'm going to walk out of here delivered. I'm going to walk out of here full of the Holy Ghost and the power. Book of Acts, that's a good book to read if you like to read something about the church. Book of Acts chapter 4 and verse number 32. Book of Acts chapter 4 and verse number 32. The Bible says, And the multitude of them that believe were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things 
common and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Let me tell you, honey, when we are all together, oh, what church do you go to? I go to the sanctuary. Oh, what's that church like? We're a Pentecostal. What kind of Pentecostal? Woo! An apostolic yeah, Pentecostal. Yeah, yeah. We're one God tongue talking, holy, rolling, heaven, God, people of God. We're the people where Jesus' name is paramount because of every tongue going to bow. And every, everybody's going to submit Jesus. to the power of Jesus Christ. Every knee shall bow. Of course, the tongue shall bow too. Put it under control. That's where we go. We go to where it happens. And the way this kind of a church service happens, again, is together when we're in unity with God, connected to the power of God that is readily available and wanting to flow among us. I tell you today, you're pulling the preacher right out of my heart. I'm just feeling that unction. I, I don't feel like I'm a cheerleader section. I just feel like, you know what? Yeah, pastor, this is what you need. I want to hear you. you come for? What is it that you need in your life today? God will be able to answer your prayer. I want to tell you this. This is why prayer before church is not the time to take a nap. It's not the time to catch up on your Bible reading. No, pre-service prayer is the time for each of us needs to get our flesh out of the way. So that together we can focus on being in tune, not only with one another, but with God. You see, guess what? You ever, you ever see a group of people, maybe musicians, they get up there, and it's twang and twang and twang, or how about people up there, and some are clapping on the on beat, and the others clapping on the off beat, and others aren't clapping because they didn't want to clap, but you guys clapping because it just sounds like a mess. <laughs> what happens when you turn that when you turn that key and we're all singing together and we're playing together and we're clapping all together and we're moving together and the music is right on and the songs are touching your heart and the message is coming home to your soul. Let me tell you, honey, that's an invincible force that God would release in this church. All right, I know you're waiting for this, but I'll do it anyhow. As I head for a close of this service, I wonder if today there's any among us who are ready to expect a move of God's miraculous. And if we truly are those ones, if as a church, who are in unity, ready to respond when the Spirit of God begins to move. I wonder today who it is among us that is ready to be able to be the one to operate in the power of Almighty God. Hallelujah. You ever ask yourself, well, why are you here? And what is it that we as God's people desire this very day? I want to tell you what, to see what God's going to do in our midst. I come today, this afternoon, I came this morning to see what God is going to do, who God is going to touch. I like walking around and praying with different people because I tell you what, you can see the effect of the message touch them. You can see them in their song service and tears begin to flow. You know that they're plugged in, honey. You know they're getting what they receive. Our purpose in coming together, our purpose in gathering in this place even today is to be able to enter into the presence of Almighty God as we gather together in unity, seeking for the will and the purpose of God through what? Through the Holy Ghost, doing whatever it is that God wants us to do. Would you stand with me today? I wonder this afternoon if there's anyone here that's ready to agree as one, as the Spirit of God is what empowers or hovers over the service, as it's God who right now is looking to see if there's two in this place today who are ready to agree as one. I don't know about your church and my friends today, but I feel like something good in this service is about to happen. And if you're ready and willing to get in the way of the power of unity, let the Holy Ghost flow. This altar is open and this prayer time is open. This worship session is open. Come on, God. Show up. Touch my mind. Break out of your comfort zone, brother.